Welcome back, I'm Dr. Dai. In this video, we're gonna look at section 4.3, which is about citric acid, uh, the citric acid cycle and oxidative phosphorylation. Uh, think back to our previous video on glycolysis. We left off with two pyruvate molecules. All right, in eukaryotic cells, in the presence of oxygen, very important, we have to have oxygen present, um, the pyruvate molecules left over from glycolysis um, can be transported into the mitochondria where they are then transformed into acetyl-CoA. The citric acid cycle happens in the mitochondria and you can think of it as this like circular pathway that produces carbon dioxide, ATP, so energy, and then coenzyme molecules NADH and FADH2. Um, some cycle components are also um, can also help make non-essential amino acids. Um, this cycle both builds and breaks down molecules, right? We're breaking down that pyruvate and we're releasing CO2 as we break it apart, right? And then we are making ATP, so we're adding that third phosphate group on, and we're also making NADH and FADH2. So it's catabolic and anabolic. Um, so it's important, important to keep track of how much of these various things are, are made. So the two acetyl-CoA molecules that enter into the citric acid cycle, um, are then going to lead to the release of, so for each acetyl-CoA, we're going to release two carbon dioxides, three NADHs, and one FADH, and one ATP, and then several intermediate compounds. Okay, I suggest making yourself a little table and just keeping track because that's going to be important as we move along through this. We're going to have to keep track of all the different things that get made. So you've learned about two pathways in glucose breakdown. We've got glycolysis and now we've had the citric acid cycle. They both create ATP. However, most of the ATP generated during um, aerobic glucose breakdown, it's going to come from something called oxidative phosphorylation. This process occurs in the inner mitochondria membrane in eukaryotes and in the inner cell membrane of prokaryotes, right? Because prokaryotes don't have organelles. Um, it involves passing electrons through this protein complex um, that then creates an electrochemical gradient that is used to produce ATP. And the name even tells you what it's doing, right? It's oxidative, meaning in the presence of oxygen, um, we are phosphorylating. We're adding a phosphate onto something. In this case, we're adding that phosphate onto ADP to transform it to ATP. So the electron transport chain um, the final part of aerobic respiration, it's going to transfer electrons, right? Electron transport chain. Um, with each transfer, the electron is going to lose some of its energy. This loss of energy is used to pump hydrogen ions across the inner mitochondrial membrane. So we remove hydrogens across the membrane. And it's going to create an electrochemical gradient. Hopefully you remember those from back in chapter two. Um, oxygen acts as the final electron acceptor. So it's going to combine with hydrogen ions to form water. The movement of hydrogen ions across the membrane powers something called the ATP synthase. So when you see the letters ASE at the end of a word, that often means that it's an enzyme. In this case, ATP, so we know it has something to do with ATP, synth, like synthesize, uh, ACE, enzyme. So ATP synthase is an enzyme that synthesizes ATP. Um, this process is also called uh, chemiosmosis, and it accounts for 90% of the ATP produced during aerobic glucose breakdown. Um, oxidative phosphorylation encompasses the electron transport chain and ATP synthesis through chemiosmosis. Okay, so the electron transport chain was where we were creating that electrochemical gradient and then ATP synthase is powered by that gradient that was created during the electron transport chain. So they're connected. Okay, how much ATP are we talking about here? So ATP production from glucose isn't, isn't fixed. 
Um, it varies due to a few different factors. So first, different species have variations in the number of hydrogen ions that are pumped across the mitochondrial membrane. Um, second, the movement of electrons across the membrane varies as well. Um, NADH from glycolysis can't easily enter the mitochondria. Um, depending on whether NAD plus or FAD plus, the precursors to NADH and FADH2, um, they act as electron carriers. They, depending on whether they're acting as electron carriers, the ATP yield differs there too. Um, different tissues use NADH, um, like the liver and FADH2 preferably like the brain as their electron transporters. So it just depends on the cell type, the organism type, what things are going on. <clears throat> um, additionally, glucose catabolisms, ATP yield is influenced by the use of intermediate compounds for other cellular processes. So various molecules that enter the glycolytic pathway for energy extraction, um, some intermediates can be derived to form nucleic acids, amino acids, lipids, other compounds. Um, so it kind of varies depending on what your cell needs to be doing. Um, overall, glucose catabolism captures approximately 34% of the energy within glucose in a living system. That is not very efficient, 34%. Um, you're losing 66% of the stored energy from glucose going through this process. Just to kind of give you something to think about. All right. So remember, as you study this section, keep track of all the products from each reaction. And I, again, making a little table is a really good way to help you do this. And I will see you all in our next video.